Punchinello, Volume 2, No. 27, the 1st of October, 1870 asterisk 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 Conant's Patent Binders for Punchinello, to preserve the paper for binding, will be sent post paid, on receipt of $1, by Punchinello Publishing Co., 83 Nassau Street, New York City. We will mail free a cover lettered and stamped, with new title page for binding first volume, on receipt of 50 cents, or the title page alone, free, on application to Punchinello Publishing Co., 83 Nassau Street. Harrison Bradford and Co. S. Steel Pens These pens are of a finer quality, more durable and cheaper than any other pen in the market. Special attention is called to the following grades, as being better suited for business purposes than any pen manufactured. The 50522 and the anti-corrosive. We recommend for bank and office use. D. Appleton & Co., sole agents for United States. Punchinello Volume 2 Number 27 Saturday, the 1st of October, 1870 Published by the Punchinello Publishing Company, 83 Nassau Street, New York The Mystery of Mr. E. Drood, by Orpheus C. Kerr, continued in this number See 15th page for extra premiums. Bound volume number 1. The first volume of Punchinello, ending with number 26, the 24th of September, 1870, bound in fine cloth, will be ready for delivery on the 1st of October, 1870. Price $2.50. Sent post paid to any part of the United States on receipt of price. A copy of the paper for one year, from the 1st of October, number 27, and the bound volume, the latter prepaid, will be sent to any subscriber for $5.50. Three copies for one year, and three bound volumes with an extra copy of bound volume, to any person sending us three subscriptions for $16.50. One copy of paper for one year, with a fine chromo premium, for $4 single copies, mailed free.10 back numbers can always be supplied, as the paper is electrotyped. Book canvassers will find this volume a very saleable book. Orders supplied at a very liberal discount. All remittances should be made in post office orders. Canvassers wanted for the paper, everywhere. Address, Punchinello Publishing Company, 83 Nassau St, NYPO Box No. 2783. Applications for advertising in Punchinello should be addressed to John Nickinson, room number 4, number 83 Nassau Street NY First and Avril Steam, Lithograph, and Letterpress Printers, Embossers, Engravers, and Label Manufacturers. Sketches and estimates furnished upon application. 23 Platt Street and 20 to 22 Gold Street, New York. P.O. Box 2845. To news dealers. Punchinello's Monthly. The weekly numbers for August, bound in a handsome cover is now ready. Price, 50 cents. The trade supplied by the American News Company, 
who are now prepared to receive orders. Wevel and Hammer, Wood Engravers, 208 Broadway, New York. Foley's Gold Pens. The Best and Cheapest. 256 Broadway. Bowling Green Savings Bank 33 Broadway, New York. Open every day from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Deposits of any sum, from $0.10 cents to $10,000 will be received. 6% interest, free of government tax interest on new deposits commences on the first of every month. Henry Smith President Reeves E. Selms, Secretary. Walter Roche, Edward Hogan, Vice Presidents. The only journal of its kind in America. The American Chemist, a monthly journal of theoretical, analytical and technical chemistry devoted especially to American interests. Edited by Chaz. F. Chandler, Ph.D., and W. H. Chandler. The proprietors and publishers of The American Chemist, having purchased the subscription list and stock of the American reprint of the Chemical News, have decided to advance the interests of American chemical science by the publication of a journal which shall be a medium of communication for all practical, thinking experimenting, and manufacturing scientific men throughout the country. The columns of the American chemist are open for the reception of original articles from any part of the country subject to approval of the editor. Letters of inquiry on any points of interest within the scope of the journal will receive prompt attention. The American Chemist is a journal of especial interest to schools and men of science, to colleges, apothecaries, druggists, physicians assayers, dyers, photographers, manufacturers, and all concerned in scientific pursuits. Subscription, $5 per annum, in advance, 50 CTS. Per number. Specimen copies, 25 CTS. Address William Baldwin and Co., Publishers and Proprietors. 434 Broom Street, New York. A new and much needed book. Maternity A Popular Treatise for Young Wives and Mothers by T.S. Verdi, A.M., M.D., of Washington, D.C. Dr. Verdi is a well-known and successful homeopathic practitioner, of thorough scientific training and large experience. His book has arisen from a want felt in his own practice, as a monitor to young wives, a guide to young mothers, and an assistant to the family physician. It deals skillfully, sensibly, and delicately with the perplexities of early married life, as connected with the holy duties of maternity, giving information which women must have either in conversation with physicians, or from such a source as this, evidently the preferable mode of learning, for a delicate and sensitive woman. Plain and intelligible, but without offence to the most fastidious taste, the style of this book must commend it to careful perusal. It treats of the needs, dangers, and alleviations of the time of travail, and gives extended detailed instructions for the care and medical treatment of infants and children throughout all the perils of early life. As a mother's manual, it will hear a large sale, and as a book of special and reliable information on very important topics, it will be heartily welcomed. 
handsomely printed on laid paper, beveled boards, extra English cloth, 12 mo, 450 pages. Price $2.25. For sale by all booksellers, or will be sent post paid on receipt of the price by J.B. Ford & Co. Publishers, 39 Park Row, New York. Jane Nickinson begs to announce to the friends of Punchinello, comma, residing in the country, that, for their convenience, he has made arrangements by which, on receipt of the price of any standard book published, the same will be forwarded, postage paid. Parties desiring catalogues of any of our publishing houses, can have the same forwarded by enclosing two stamps. Office of Punchinello Publishing Co., 83 Nassau Street. P.O. Box 2783. Henry L. Stevens, Artist, No. 160 Fulton Street, New York. Geo. B. Boland, Draftsman and Designer No. 160 Fulton Street, Room No. 11, New York. Entered according to Act of Congress, in the year 1870, by the Punchinello Publishing Company, in the Clerk's Office of the District Court of the United States, for the Southern District of New York. Half a year, half a year, half a year onward has Punchinello advanced since he wafted his first number to the four quarters of the globe. His road has not been a very easy one to travel. Bad characters lurked behind the fences, from which they would sometimes take a sneak shot at the showman as he passed. These fellows were awfully bad shots, though, never so much as hitting the van in which the show travels. Punchinello's return fire always set the scamps a-scampering, and all they had for their pains was the loss of their ammunition, and the discovery that the row kicked up by them had attracted crowds of people to the spot, so that Punchinello's show was capitally advertised by their noise. Punchinello's first volume, then, is a substantial fact. It is an entirely new, original, and complete article, which no family should be without. Read what the New York moon that shines for all says about it. Put a head on yourself by reading Punchinello, Volume 1. It is by far the best tonic bitters in the market. It cured the editor of this paper of a very malignant attack made by himself on Punchinello, after three applications. Several gentle critics predicted an early death for Punchinello on account of the buff color selected by him for his full-dress costume. Ha! Ha! Gentlemen, many a blow falls harmless on the wearer of a buff jerkin. As the old poet, whose name we have forgotten, might have said, had he been in the humour, he who will cuff it, eke should buff it, a maxim to which Punchinello gives his cordial adhesion. And now comes Punchinello to the beginning of his second volume, encouraged by the success of his first. If volume I of Punchinello was a chaspet, and it did make some havoc in the ranks of the enemy, Volume 2 is intended to be a mitrailleuse. It will be so arranged as to combine total annihilation with bewitching music. For instance, by turning one of the cranks by which it is worked, Punchinello will be able to project a shower of such mortiferous missiles against all abettors of crime and vice, all quacks, 
political and social, all corrupt officials, all Congress, except the right party, all torpid fogies and peddlers of red tape, all humbugs of every size and shape, in fact, as will speedily reduce them to ashes. Then, by skillfully manipulating the other crank, he can produce from it strains of such mellifluous harmony that the very telegraph poles will throng around him, as erstwhile did the trees of the forest around Orpheus, and tender their services for the transmission of his melting music to all the beautiful places on earth. It is hardly necessary to say that Hail Columbia is the very first tune on the cylinder of Punchinello's musical mitrailleuse. With his mind's eye, an apparatus expressly constructed for and fitted to his mental organization by a renowned necromancer, Punchinello sees his public surging towards him and grasping with outstretched hands at the showers of bonbon with which he plentifully supplies them from an inexhaustible casket. Among them are thousands of familiar forms, and these are mostly in the front. After these come several thousands of new forms, all pressing forward upon the heels of the others with an eagerness that augurs for Punchinello Vol to a tremendous and unparalleled success. Each of these good people carries four dollars, four dollars, in his right hand, which he waves at Punchinello, who affably accepts the greenbacks from him when within proper distance, and then dipping his pen in ink without a drop of gall in it, books the donor for a year's subscription in advance. As for party, Punchinello knows but one party, and that is the right party. Stirring times are before us. The right party is not going to lie down and sleep while the times are stirring. Nor is Punchinello. When anything that interests the right party has got to be stirred, Punchinello will be on hand. He has been so long used to stirring it, that he makes light of stirring it. He can stir with a red-hot poker and he can stir with a feather, you pays your money and you takes your choice. And now. Having stirred the spirit within him to a demonstrative pitch, Punchinello shies his cocked hat into space, and calls upon his public to give three rousing cheers for the right party. The Mystery of Mr. E. Drood An Adaptation By Orpheus C. Kerr Chapter XX An Escape the bewildered flower pot had no sooner gained her own room, enjoyed her agitated expression of face in the mirror, and tried four differently colored ribbon bows upon her collar in succession, than the thought of becoming Mr. Bumstead's bride lost the charm of its first wild novelty, and became utterly ridiculous. He was a man of commanding stature which his linen duster made appear still more long, the dark circles around his eyes would disappear in time, and he had an abusive way of referring to women which made him inexpressibly grand to women as a true poet soul, but would it be safe, would it be religiously right, for a young girl, not yet conscious of her own full power of annual monetary expenditure? to blindly risk her necessary expenses for life upon one whom the cost of a single imported bonnet, in the contingency of a general European war, might plunge into inextricable pecuniary embarrassment. Possibly, the general European war might not occur in an ordinary married lifetime as France was no longer in a condition to menace England, 
Russia would be wary about provoking the new Prussian giant, and Austria and Italy were not likely soon to forget their last military misadventures. Yet, while all the great American journals had, for the last 20 years, published daily editorials by young writers from the country, to show that such a war could not possibly be averted longer than about the day after tomorrow, would it be judicious for a young girl to marry as though that war were absolutely impossible? No. Her woman's heart sternly reiterated the pitilessly negative, and, as the ritualistic organist had plainly evinced an earnest intention to let no foreign military complications prevent her marriage with him, she felt that her only safety from his matrimonial violence must be sought in flight. With whom, though, could she take refuge? If she went to Magnolia Pendragon, all her dearest schoolmates would say that they had always loved her, despite her great faults, yet could not disguise from themselves that she seemed at last to be fairly running after Miss Pendragon's brother. Besides, Mr. Bumstead, offended by the seeming want of confidence in him evinced by her flight, would probably, take measures publicly to identify Magnolia's alpaca garment with the covering of his lost umbrella, and thus direct new suspicion against a sister and brother already bothered almost into hysterics. During the last few weeks, an attack of dyspepsia had laid the foundation of a mind in the flower pot as it generally does in other young female American boarding school thinkers, and she was now capable of that subtle line of reasoning which is the great commendation of her sex to a recognized perfect intellectual equality with man. Once decided, by her apprehension of a general European war, against marriage with J. Bumstead, she took a rather irritable view of that too attractive devotional musician, and inferred, from his not being wealthy enough to stand the test of possible transatlantic hostilities, that he must, himself, have killed Edwin Drood. His umbrella, it was well known, had been present at that fatal Christmas dinner, and a thoughtless insult offered to it even by his nephew, might have made a demon of him. Suppose that Edwin, upon returning to the dining room that night, after his temporary exercise in the open air with Montgomery Pendragon, had found his uncle, flushed with cloves, endeavouring to force a social glass of lemon tea upon the umbrella, under the impression that it was a person, and had unthinkingly accused him their eight of being momentarily unsettled in his faculties. Probably, then, hot words would have passed between them, each telling the other that he would have a nice headache in the morning and find it impossible not to look very sleepy even if he fixed his hair ever so elaborately. Blows might have followed, the uncle, in his anger, hewing the nephew limb from limb with the carving knife from the table, and subsequently carrying away the remains to the pond and there casting them in. Suppose, in his natural excitement, the uncle had hurriedly used the umbrella, opened and held downward, to carry the remains in, and, after coming home again, and snatching a nap under the table, had forgotten all about it, and thus been ever since inconsolable for his alpaca loss. As the young orphan argued thus exhaustively to herself, the extreme probability of her suppositions made her more and more frenzied to fly instantly beyond the reach of one who, in the event of a general European war, 
would not be a husband whom her head could approve. After penning a hasty farewell note to Miss Carothers, to the effect that urgent military reasons obliged her to see her guardian at once, Flora lost no time in packing a small leather satchel for travel. Two bottles of hair oil, a jar of glycerin, one of cold cream, two boxes of powder, a package of extra back hair, a file of belladonna, a camel's hair brush for the eyebrows, a rouge saucer for pinking the nails, four flasks of perfumery, a depilatory in a small flagon, and some toothpaste, were the only articles she could pause to collect for her precipitate escape, and, with them in the satchel on her arm, and a bonnet and shawl hurriedly thrown on, she stole away downstairs, and thus, from the house. Hastening to the Roach House, from whence started an omnibus for the ferry, she was quickly rattling out of Bumsteadville in a vehicle remarkable for the great number and variety of noises it could make when maddened into motion by a span of equine rivals in an immemorial walking match. Now, Borna she said to the driver, taking leave of him at the ferryboat, be sure and let Miss Carothers know that you saw me safely off, and that I was not a bit more tired than if I had walked all the way. Blushing with pleasure at the implied compliment to his equipage from such lips, the skilled horseman had not the heart to object to the wildly mutilated fragment of currency with which his fare had been paid and went back to where his steeds were taking turns in holding each other up, as happy a man as ever lost money by the change in women. Reaching the city, Miss Potts was promptly worshipped by a hack man of marked conversational powers, who, whip in hand, assured her that his carriage was widely celebrated under the titles of the rocking chair the old shoe and the glider on account of its incredible ease of motion, and that, owing to its exquisite abbreviation of travel to the emotions, those who rode in it had actually been known to dispute that they had ridden even half the distance for which they were charged. Did he know where Mr. Dibble the lawyer, lived, in Nassau Street, near Fulton. If she meant lawyer Dibble, near Fulton Street, in Nassau, next door but one to the second house below, and directly opposite the building across the way, there was just one span of buckskin horses in the city that could take a carriage built expressly for ladies to that place as naturally as though it were a stable. It was a place that he, the hack man, always associated with his own mother, because he was so familiar with it in childhood, and had often thought of driving to it blindfolded for a wager. Proud to learn that her guardian was so well known in the great city, and delighted that she had met a charioteer so minutely familiar with his house of business, Flora stepped readily into the providential hack, which thereupon instantly began rocking chairing, old shoeing, and gliding. Any one of these celebrated processes, by itself, might have been desirable but their indiscriminate and impetuous combination in the present case gave the flower pot a confused impression that her whole ride was a startling series of incessant sharp turns around obdurate street corners, and kept her plunging about like an early young Protestant tossed in a Romish blanket. Instinctively holding her satchel aloft, to save its fragile contents from fracture, she rocked, showed and glided all over the interior of the vehicle, without hope of gaining breath enough for even one scream, until, nearly unconscious, and, 
with her bonnet driven halfway into her chignon, she was helped out by the hack man at her guardian's door. I am dying, she groaned. Then please remember me in your will, to the extent of two dollars returned the hack man with much humor. You're only a little seasick, miss, as often happens to people in humble circumstances when they ride in a carriage for the first time. Still panting, Miss Potts paid and discharged this friendly man, and, weariedly entering the building, followed the signs upstairs to her guardian's office. After knocking several times at the right door without reply, she turned the knob, and entered so softly that the venerable lawyer was not aroused from the slumber into which he had fallen in his chair by the window. With a copy of Putnam's magazine still grasped in his honest right hand, could Mr. Dibble slept like a drugged person, nor could the young girl awaken him until, by a happy inspiration, she had snatched away the monthly and cast it through the casement. Am I dreaming, exclaimed the aged man when thus suddenly rescued from his deadly lethargy at last is that you, my dear, or are you your late mother? I am your ridiculously unhappy ward answered the flowerpot, tremulously. Oh, poor, dear, absurd Eddie. And you have come here all alone? Yes, and to escape being married to Eddie's perfectly hateful uncle who has the same as ordered me to become his utterly disgusted bride. Oh, why is it, why is it, that I must be thus persecuted by young men without property? Why is it that perfectly horrid madmen on salaries are allowed to claim me as their own? My dear cried the old lawyer, leading her to a chair, and striving to speak soothingly. If Mr. Bumstead desires to marry you he must indeed be insane. Such a man ought really to be confined he continued, pacing thoughtfully up and down the room. This must have been the idea that was already turning his brain when, bless my soul, he actually intimated, first, that I, and then, that Mr. Simpson, had killed his nephew. He thinks, now, that I, or Magnolia Pendragon, may have done it, the hateful creature, said Flora, passionately. I see, I see assented Mr. Dibble, nodding. When he has you in his head, my dear, he himself must clearly be out of it. You shall stay here and take tea with me, and then I will take you to French's hotel for your accommodation during the night. It was a sight to see him tenderly help her off with her bonnet, and suggestive to hear him say, that if a man could only take off his brains as easily as a woman hers, what a relief it would be to him occasionally. It was curious to see him peep into her bottle-filled satchel, with an old man's freedom, and to hear him audibly wonder thereate, whether, after all, men were any more addicted than women to the social glass when they wanted to put a better face on affairs. And, after the waiter bringing him toast and tea from a neighboring restaurant had brought an additional slice and cup for the guest, it was pleasant to behold him smiling across the office table at that guest, and encouraging her to eat as much as she would if a member of his sex were not looking. It must be absurdly ridiculous to stay here all alone, as you do, sir observed Flora. But I am not always alone answered Mr. Dibble. My clerk, Mr. Bladems, now taking a vacation in the country, is generally here though, to be sure, 
I may lose him before long. He's turned literary. How perfectly frightful, said Miss Potts. He has set up for a genius, my child, and is now engaged upon a great American novel. Discontented with the law, he is giving great attention to this, but free trade will not, I am afraid, allow any American publisher to bring it out. Free trade, repeated Flora. Yes, my dear, free trade, that is, while American publishers can steal foreign novels for nothing. They are not going to pay anything for native fiction. Yawning behind her hand, the flower pot murmured something about free trade being positively absurd, and her guardian went on, Nevertheless, Mr. Bladems is going on with his work, which he calls the amateur detective, and if it ever does come out you shall have a copy dot, but... By the by added the lawyer, suddenly, you have not yet fully described to me the interview in which poor Mr. Edwin's uncle offered to become your husband. She gave him a full history of the ritualistic organist's handsome offer to her of his H and H. Adding her own final decision in the matter as precipitated by the possibility of a general European war and Mr. Dibble heard the whole with an air of studious attention. Although I have certainly no particular reason for befriending Mr. Bumstead said he, reflectively, I shall take measures to keep him from you. Now come with me to French's hotel. Tomorrow I will call there for you, you know, and then, perhaps, you may be taken to see your friend, Miss Pendragon. Having obtained for his ward a room in the hotel named, and seen her safely to its shelter, the good old lawyer visited the barroom of the establishment, for the purpose of ascertaining whether any evil disposed person could get in through that way for the disturbance of his fair charge after which he departed for his home in Gowanus. To be continued. Motto for all good Cubans. The label we delight in physics, s. pain. The plays and shows. Unctually as announced, the Fifth Avenue Theatre has reopened. It has been improved by the addition of several private boxes that remind one of the square pews in old-fashioned churches. By the way, why do Puseyites object to pews, and by the erection of a hydrant near the conductor's seat, so that when the audience can endure Stoepel's music no longer, they can turn on the water and drown him and his long-winded orchestra. This latter improvement meets with our hearty approval, and we earnestly hope to see it put to the excellent use for which it is designed without further delay. Manager Daly is now offering to his patrons the new comedy of Man and Wife. The old-fashioned play of that name, which is daily acted everywhere about us, is usually more of a tragedy than a comedy. But Mr. Daly's man and wife is comedy, farce, muscular Christianity, and paralysis pleasantly mingled together. As thus, act I. Geoffrey Delamain and his brother are seen conversing in an arbor. Don't let the printer imagine that I mean an arbor. It was bad enough in Wilkie Collins to banish his dramatis personae to Scotland, but he was nevertheless too humane to send them to Michigan. Julius Delamain Geoffrey, you really must do something. The unmannerly people who are just coming into the theatre make such a noise that I couldn't be heard if I took the trouble to preach to you for an hour 
so I won't attempt to make my meaning any clearer. Jeffrey. I will or I won't, I forget which. However, the audience can't hear. We've got a pretty good house here tonight I wonder if my muscles really show to any extent. Here comes Lady Lundy and her friends. Lady Lundy. I choose everybody to play croquet on my side. The rest may play on Blanche's side. Miss Sylvester, you look as if you could not stand alone. Therefore I order you to play. Annie Sylvester. Madam, I will. Geoffrey, meet me here in ten minutes, or you'll be sorry for it. Exit everybody. Annie and Geoffrey returning on tiptoe. Annie. You must marry me this afternoon. Meet me at the inn on the moor. Jeffrey. I won't cross the moor with you. Desdemona foolishly crossed the moor, and came to grief in consequence. I take warning by her. I hate you, but I suppose I must marry you, or you'll sell all my letters to the Sunday. They go out to be married. Arnold enters and makes love to Blanche. Sir Patrick does the comic business with Lewis's usual humor. What a nice man Lewis must be for girls to quarrel with, he makes up so nicely, this is a joke. Lady Lundy enters and announces that Annie is no longer her governess, that misguided person having thrown up her situation for the irrational reason that it was an interesting one, and having fled in the silence of the after-dinner hour. Shrieks of horror from the young ladies, who desist from knocking their croquet balls into the orchestra and the proscenium boxes, and triumphant falling of a new act drop. Stoepel, having thought of a sweet passage for the fife, in a Chinese opera, plays it uninterruptedly for four to five minutes. A deaf old gentleman approvingly remarks that this is really classical music. Act 2. Dot, a storm at the inn on the moor. Miss Sylvester waits for her Geoffrey and her tea. Enter Arnold. Arnold. Geoffrey can't come, so he has sent me. I know your situation, and shall have to feel for you if it gets much darker and they don't bring candles. That is, if I'm to shake hands with you. I have told everybody here that you are my wife. Let's have a little game of seven up, and pass the time profitably. Annie. Oh, villain, I mean Geoffrey. You have deserted me. Oh, rash young person, I mean you, Arnold, I'm inclined to think that you've married me by Scotch law, without having meant it. If so, you'll have to go to America and see Beecher about a divorce. Curtain subsequently falls, and Stoepel orders the big drum to beat for an hour while the musicians take advantage of the noise to tune their instruments. Deaf old gentleman remarks again that he does like Wagner's music. Half the audience hold their ears, while the other half flee madly away until the enter act is over. Act 3. Jeffrey boxes with his trainer and slings Indian clubs and wooden dumbbells. Geoffrey. There. Thank heaven I didn't break anything. The scenery, the footlights, or a blood vessel will get broken before the week is out, however, if this prize ring business isn't cut out. Here comes Arnold. 
Arnold. How's Miss Sylvester? Jeffrey. If you say anything more about her, I'll put a head on you. She's your wife. You're a married man. Arnold. Married. You infamous editor of a two-cent daily paper, I deny it. Curtain again falls, and Stoepel plays the entire opera of Anani for two hours. Deaf old gentleman remarks that music is the Stoepel entertainment at this theatre, and that he really likes it. The rest of the audience look at him with horror, as though he were a sort of aggravated and superfluous cannibal. Act 4. Sir Patrick proves that Geoffrey is married to Annie, and that Arnold isn't. Geoffrey takes his weeping wife home with him. Everybody finds out that Geoffrey is an enormous liar and an unmitigated blackguard. Through the open windows are seen the editors of The Sun and the Free Press, each determined to be the first to offer Geoffrey a place on the staff of his respective journal. The curtain falls and Stoepel directs each member of the orchestra to play the tune that he may like best. After three hours of this sort of thing a humane person in the audience brings in a saw and begins to file it. The rest of the audience are thereupon gently lulled to sleep by the music of the file. So soft and soothing does it sound by contrast with Stoepel's demoniac orchestra. Act V. Annie, in the midst of misery and a gorgeous silk dress with lace trimmings, is seen going to bed in her best clothes, and without taking her hair down, this being the well-known custom among fashionably dressed girls. Jeffrey enters and attempts to strangle her, but she is awakened by the considerate forethought of a dumb woman, who loudly calls her, and Jeffrey conveniently lies down and dies of paralysis. All the rest of the dramatis personae enter, and indulge in exclamations of joy. The curtain falls for the last time and Stoepel is removed under the protection of a strong platoon of policemen, to the secret abode where Daly keeps him hidden during the day from the wrath of an outraged public. And the undersigned goes home to breakfast, it being now nearly six a dot m dot, reflecting upon the beauty of the theatre, the neatness of the scenery, the general ability of the actors, the capabilities of the play, after Mr. Daly shall have cut it down to a reasonable length, the pluck of the young manager, and the unredeemed badness of the orchestra, as it is conducted by Mr. Stoepel. Tell me, gentle Daly, tell, why in the name of all that is intelligent, do you let Stoepel transform each enter act at your theatre into a prolonged purgatory, by the villainous way in which he plays the most execrable music, for the most intolerable periods of time? Matador L.N. in Prussia Yes, I am quite upset, in fact, I'm dizzy yet with all that rapid riding, day and night. But still, two things I see, they've made an end of me, and blown the empire higher than a kite. Yes, here I am, at last, and all my dreams are past. Didn't think to enter Prussia thus. Confound that Volwart's man. When first the war began he seemed as logy as an omnibus. For. Smell the swite sakais. The same in every place, eh? How these big Germans love an ugly stench. My. What a taste they've got for articles that rot, and can it be, 
they live so near the French. I'm in a pretty nest. And, worse than all the rest, is thinking how I got here, there's the rub. When I have mused a while on all my luck, so vile, I almost wish they'd hit me with a club. It's very well to say, I might have won the day, if things had only gone this way or that, I should have made them go, and let these Germans know that they must go, too. Or be cut down flat. They didn't go, it seems, except twas in my dreams. And, consequently, I must bid goodbye to titles, power and state, which I enjoyed of late, and curse my dismal fate, poor Louis and I. The Plymouth Rock The fact of his having relinquished, at the imperative demand of society, his weekly visits to the watering places, need lead no one to believe that Mr. Punchinello does not like a little fresh air. And surely a half a day or so by the seaside need jeopardize no one's social standing if the thing is not repeated too often. At least so thought Mr. P, and he determined, one fine morning last week, that he would hurry up his business as fast as possible, and take a trip on Colonel Fisk's steamboat to Sandy Hook. A man calling with a bundle of puns detained him so long that he found that he would not be able to reach the 11 a.m. boat without he made unusual haste. Rushing into the street, therefore, he hailed a passing hack and ordered the driver to take him, as quickly as possible, to the Plymouth Rock. When the carriage stopped, and the man opened the door, Mr. P rubbed his eyes, for he had fallen into a doze, on the way, and sprang hastily out. But what a sight met his gaze! Before him was the hack, covered with mud and dust, and the horses in a position indicating utter exhaustion, to his right lay a huge unsymmetrical stone, while behind him rolled the heaving waters of Cape Cod Bay. The man had mistaken his directions, and had driven him to John Carver's old Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts, instead of James Fisk Jr.'s steamboat at Pier 28, North River. There's the rock, your honor said the man, pointing to the misshapen stone, and an awful time I've had a driving your honor to it. How long have you been, coming here, asked the astounded Mr. P. Nigh on to three days, your honor, and I drove as fast as I could, hoping to get back by the Sunday in time for the Centhral Park but I had to stop sometimes for feed and wather, and it's no use me whipping up after all, for sorra the good them horses will be for the Centhral Park on the Sunday. And how much do I owe you for all this? asked Mr. P. Well, sir said the man, I won't charge your honour nothing for the feed and my victuals, for I'd had to have found them if your hadna hired me and I'll only charge ye three dollars a hour, for sure your honour never give me the least throuble, slipping there as swart as an infant all the time, and that'll be just two hundred and four dollars, and if yet honour could give me a thrifle besides to drink your health, I'd be obliged to your honour. Mr. P gazed alternately at the man, the carriage, the horses, and the rock, and then he paid the driver two hundred and four dollars and twenty-five cents. The worthy Miles Ian pocketed the money and declared his intention of proceeding to Boston, which was only about forty miles away, and taking the railroad for New York if I don't, ye see, your honor, 
I'll never get back in time for the Sunday, and the horses will be resting in the cars. As the man made his preparations and departed, Mr. P stood and watched him until he slowly faded out of sight. When he had entirely disappeared, Mr. P sat down upon the rock and reflected. Now that he was here, what had he best do? He had never seen the rock before, and as it struck him that possibly some of his patrons might be in the same unfortunate condition, he concluded that he would take a few sketches of it for their benefit. But he did not succeed very well. The first drawing he made had a strange appearance. It looked more like an old woman tied to a post, and surrounded by what seemed to be flames, than anything else. This surely was not a correct view of this famous rock, and so Mr. P commenced another sketch. This, however, looked so much like a man with a broad-brimmed hat, hanging by his neck to a rope that he concluded to try again. His next sketch bore a striking resemblance to something that certainly did not seem like a rock, but which, after some deliberation, he found to look very much like a shrinking southern negro, forced into the ranks to supply the place of a citizen of Massachusetts. Everybody might not be able to see this, but Mr. P thought he perceived it plainly. The last sketch made by Mr. P somewhat resembled one whose connection with the Plymouth Rock has certainly been of more practical benefit to the public than that of any of the old founders or anybody else, at least so far as Mr. P can see. If anyone doubts this, let him ask General Grant. Now should his readers see anything at all suggestive of sober and beneficial reflection in these sketches, Mr. P.S. visit to Plymouth Rock was not made in vain. A letter from L.N.D. Punchinello, The Empire is Peace, as usual. If, some time hence, it should be discovered to have been otherwise, at the time of writing this letter, you will please understand that I wasn't there, at that moment, having had a little business to transact with my good friend Williams, of Prussia. I am at present engaged upon a tour of the German states in the company of a pleasant little excursion party, who met me at Sedan, and received me warmly. Everybody seems glad to greet me particularly at this time, and all express regrets that I couldn't have come earlier in the season. They are aware of the interest I have ever felt in the great German people, and I am assured they welcome with enthusiasm my pet theory of the solidarity of nations. I intend remaining here a while, feeling sure that there is nothing to call me homeward for the present. The truth is, my friend, I am getting weaned of the French people. So soon as my obligations to my very good friends in Prussia will permit, you may look for me in New York. Yes, dear Punchinello, greatest and beat of philosophers. Expect to see me walking into your sanctum one of these fine mornings probably with my son Louis, delighted to see you, and glad to turn my back on those scenes so long familiar, which, in their new and popular dress, could hardly be expected to afford me much exhilaration. From an inferior man, I should expect officious and quite gratuitous commiseration over the fate of the late empire. You, however, will readily perceive it to be possible that I should rather be congratulated. 
you would not exchange your dignified leisure, your careless toils, for the best of sovereignties. Why, then, should I, who have made you my exemplar, feel a pang at parting with a scepter which for years has only tired my hand? I picture myself seated with my family on the heights at We or Ken, smoking a good cigarette, and musing on the affairs of nations as I watch the flow of that superb river, as much finer than the Rhine, my friend, as wine is finer than Lagerbier, which I have often, in days gone by, admired and extolled by the hour. I expect they will pleasantly call me Duke Hudson, and my son the Prince of Staten Island. No matter. I can always face the inevitable. And that reminds me of the late war, in which the inevitable that I was always being called upon to face, was the inevitable Prussian. But I have faced much more terrible things. In your very city of Hoboken, I have stood face to face with a German creditor. Will anyone henceforth doubt my fortitude? I have one rather comforting reflection, apropos to that rencontre. I have taken care to arm myself against future assaults of that nature. I am gold-plated. If your highly gifted corps of artists should wish to depict me in a connection which would satisfy my sense of honor, let them make a sketch entitled, The Two Exiles, one of whom may be my uncle at St. Helena, the other, me, at We or Ken, with my family near, a glass of wine at my side, a cigarette in one hand, and a copy of Punchinello in the other but let me not anticipate. Sufficient unto the day is the d. evil thereof. Royally yours, L.N. Maxim for the next new president. A place for everybody, and everybody in his place. On color. Cousin Bella, admiring picture. How is it, Fred? that you produce such lovely color, and with so much facility. Fred, thinking of his mere shome. I don't tell everybody that, you inquisitive tease, but fact is, I put the stump of an old paintbrush in the bowl, and smoke the oiliest tobacco I can find. The Battle at Sedan Special Correspondence of Punchinello This paper is the only paper on the planet which has a correspondent at the seat of war, wherever that seat may be. The following dispatch was sent to us by cable at a total expense of $21,000. It was a still, calm night. The glorious moon was sailing through the sky, the river was running water, the clouds were cloudy, the soldiers were soldiering. I stepped out of my tent and tumbled over von Moltke. He took my arm and invited me to the tent of the crown prince. Moltke said I, what's your little game? Penny Ante replied he. Tis bn added I you are a French spy. Ha. Ha, said he, grasping my collar. Ho. Ho. Das ish gut added I then your Dutch side he, dropping me like a hot pair of tongs. In the tent we found the king, the crown prince, General Steinmetz, General Sheridan, and General Forsyth. Moulty said I, introduce me to the king. Bill said he, this is Jenkins. Bill held out his foot and I took a suck at his great toe. Then we went at the game. 
Bill is pretty good at it, but then he doesn't stand any chance beside Moulty. The crown prince lost at least 14 cents, and, just as he had a splendid opportunity to retrieve his losses, in came an aide, who announced that the French had squatted. Where, cried von Moltke. In Sedan replied the aide. I knew it said Moltke. Bill, I told you they had no horses for a regular carriage. Then we went out. The king invited me to sit in his carriage with Moltke and Sheridan. We reached the scene of war. The moon shone, the mountains were mountainous, the trees were treey, and the soft September breeze was breezy. Bismarck came up and asked the king to let him cut behind. Bis said I, take my seat, I'll take a trip to the French camp. So I tripped over to the French camp and found things somewhat mixed. The moon shone. Steadily the Prussian troops advanced, and, with a heroism worthy of a better cause, the French retreated. The Emperor wanted to die in the rear of his men. Nap said I, you'd better get up and get. The Prussians are coming. Jenkins said he, kiss me for my mother, I'm betrayed. Why didn't you have more cheese pots, said I I'll surrender said he, get out a white flag. So I took one of Eugene's old pocket handkerchiefs which I found in the tent, stuck it on the end of the saber of the nephew of his uncle put Nap in the carriage, jumped in myself and drove to the Prussian camp. The moon shone, all nature smiled, the rivers were rivery, the sedans were cherry. Bill received us very coolly at first, but I gave Bis the wink, and he suggested to his majesty that he'd better take the emperor prisoner. Nap said Bill, is the game up? Bill said Nap, you've scored the game. I leave my old clothes to the regent. I hope she'll like the breeches. Then he treated to cigarettes, and we all went back to our game of penny ante. Nap wouldn't join us. He said he'd just been playing a game with Crown's ante and he was busted. We'd hardly got the cards dealt, when Bill turned to Bismarck and asked, I say, Bis, won't you run over and telegraph to the old woman something about our Fritz? Let Jenkins go said Bis. Of course I assented to the proposition. Where the devil is Fritz, said Bill. Oh, he's been sleeping for the last two hours, said Moltk. Never mind, said Bill, telegraph a victory by Fritz. So I telegraphed, a great victory has been won by our Fritz. What great things have we done for ourselves? We'll keep it up, old woman. Signed, Bill. When I reached the tent everybody was asleep. Nap was reclining gracefully on the breast of Bismarck, as affectionately as if they were brothers-in-law. The moon shone, the sky was skyey, the hills were hilly, and all nature was getting up. Anybody who says the above did not come over the cable lies wickedly, maliciously lies, with intent to deceive. As soon as Jack Smithers smack sails, I'll send you a piece of the cable it came over. Mr. Bull, the sutler of the world. Hiram Green to Koenig Wilhelm he reviews the career of a lunatic. A graduate with nice ideas. King Wilhelm, 
most noble lunatic, we gates all der while. According to the marine cable, I understand you've given old bony a slosh on der cope mit der Schweitzer case, or in good plain United States talk, Louis Napoleon has taken his umpire, and shoved it up the spout, without the benefit of judge or jury. I kinda had an e-day that when the now busted up ruler of the umpire tackled you, that it would have been a ten dollar greenback in his pantaloons pocket if he had let the contract out on shares to his nabbers. I've allers heard say that as able-bodied a lunatic as the French say you be, could handle any three ordinary men. Be be just or gobbler dame to quote from our friend Billy Shakespeare. We have had evidences here, of the superiority of lunatics, more en once. If a man can prove that his upper story is cracked, he can wallop his wife to his heart's content, and if anybody interferes, he can pop him off with a six-shooter and the law will stand to his back. Judges and juries, when trying such a man, think he is some punkins, while all the illustrated papers stick the celebrated lunatic's photograph onto their first page. I would like to ask you, if your insanity is of the melancholic, this being the season when melons is ripe, or is it of the pro-temper kind? I shouldn't he wonder, between you and I, but that you inherited it from your illustrious aunt sister, Frederick the Great, who was about as sassy a lunatic as you can pick up. What we need just now, and what we have needed for a good while, is a able-bodied lunatic to send to England as minister. With such a crazy statesman as you be. The mere little Alabami claims would have been squared up long ago, or else, if this court knows herself intimately, the British lion would have been sent off howling, with a tin kittle tied to his cordial appendage. You probably observe, I go heavy on lunatics. Yes, sir. They are the coming man the sixteenth commandment or Chinese coolers can't hold a candle to em. When a man ups and does something nobody else can do, if they'd bust their biler trying, then he is sought down as being crazy as a loon by his jealous nabbers. I haven't heard whether Bice Marks or Fritz's upper stories were shaky, or not, but there ain't the shadow of a doubt in my mind. But what both of these long-headed chaps are madder than Geo. Francis train any day, and that the crown prince employs his spare time striking tragic attitudes, and repeating the Folrin well-known verses, I am not mad. I am not mad. But only on my muscle. Old Nap D been glad if he and King Dad had never got into a tussle. My object in writing to you, great conqueror of the man whose son was so bully at picking up bullocks, is to congratulate you. Speaking after the manner of men, you are an old cinnamon bud. Having served my country for four years as gusties of the peace, you can rely on my giving a good sound opinion, from which there ain't no repeal to a higher court. What do you think of my starting a college here for the purpose of educating lunatics? We've got three colleges here, Harvard, Yale, and the Electoral College, and a scaly a lot of weak need timber than these institutions sometimes turns out would make you stick to your stomach to look at. Stujangs are turned out from these as alums with putty aristocratic e-days into their nozzles. 
I once knew a chap who was a graduate of one of these institutions of learning. He was more aristocratic than a retired church deacon. When his wife died, he wanted her to look respectable at the funeral, so he sent to one of his neighbors to borrow a silk dress for the corpse to wear during the funeral services. Thinks I. That was shoving a good thing rather too deep in the ground, merely for the sake of pilling on the agony. However, that's the way of the world, Lanin will stick out, and you can't atop her. That son of your N, Fritz, is smarter than a two year old heifer. If he ain't in that precarious situation which Sri F. Norton calls mummery and the Onida community says Amen. To, but which good honest folks, like you and I, calls married, then I would say that he might go further and fairer sight for sir, than to come over here and examine my stock of rice and feminine genders. Mrs. Green the mother of my daughters, is a woman who understands her biz as housekeeper, and anybody who gets one of her gals won't be troubled to death by keeping a cook to boss them around. During the prosperous days of Skeen Sparrow, when I was basking in the sunshine of official life, and had a political axe to grind, Maria's bile dinners used to fetch politicians to their milk, equal to the way a big dinner at Delmonico's, NY, will flop over a New York alderman. The surest way of getting round a public man, is via his stomach. Like Aladdin's lamp, you can by merely giving a rub, bring around most any man, by filling him up with grub. But, most noble cuss of the realm, I must lay aside my goose quill, and go and do the family chores. But afore I close this letter let me speak a word for your noble prisoner, El Napoleon, Esquire deal gently with him. Old ho he played the wrong card when he pitched into you, recollect the old maxim, never but a fellow when he is down. France is better, in a good many respects, for things Louis done for him. But he has gone to the shades, and Shakespeare aptly says, The evil which men do, lives a darn sight longer than the evil they don't do. Which sentiment showed that old Sheikh was a wholesale dealer in human nature. Hoping that in the days of your prosperity, you won't fidget your poor relations, sick as mothers-in-law and the like, and when they come to visit you, you won't say, Nix come or else I will dry up. Yours anon, Hiram Green, Esquire, late gusties of the peace the lovers. In different moods and tenses. Sally Salter, she was a young teacher, who taught, and her friend. Charlie Church, was a preacher, who prought, though his enemies called him a screecher, who scrought. His heart, when he saw her, kept sinking, and sunk, and his eye, meeting hers, began winking, and vunk, while she, in her turn, fell to thinking, and thunk. He hastened to woo her, and sweetly he wooed for his love grew until to a mountain it grew, and what he was longing to do, then he doot. In secret he wanted to speak, and he spoke, to seek with his lips what his heart long had soak, so he managed to let the truth leak, and it loke. He asked her to ride to the church, and they rode, they so sweetly did glide, that they both thought they glowed, and they came to the place to be tied, and were towed. Then homeward he said let us drive, and they drove, 
and soon as they wished to arrive, they arrove, for whatever he couldn't contrive, she controve. The kiss he was dying to steal, then he stole, at the feet where he wanted to kneel, there he knelt, and he said, I feel better than ever I fall. So they to each other kept clinging, and clung, while time his swift circuit was winging, and vroom, and this was the thing he was bringing, and brung. The man Sally wanted to catch, and had caught, that she wanted from others to snatch, and had snort, was the one that she now liked to scratch, and she scrawled and Charlie's warm love began freezing and froze, while he took to teasing, and cruelly toes the girl he had wished to be squeezing, and squoze. Wretch, he cried when she threatened to leave him, and left, how could you deceive me, as you have deceived? And she answered, I promised to cleave, and I've cleft. Amos Keeter a pretty idea of Mr. Van Littledram, he takes his youngster out for a sail, thus, and saves the expense of a boat. The Poems of the Cradle Canto 7 Tom, Tom the piper's son, stole a pig, and away he ran, the pig was eat, and Tom was beat. And Tom went roaring down the street. The above verse immortalizes an event that caused great excitement in the period in which it occurred, although at the present date it would not be considered of much account, or cause the smallest ripple on the glassy calm of our most sleepy village. We have progressed beyond being stirred by any little peccadillo such as the theft of a pig or a sheep, or even a watch or a purse, unless it contains a large amount, and was taken under the most aggravating circumstances from ourselves. A robbery of a bank of a million, when it happens to affect hundreds of people, or a midnight murder executed with the malignancy of a fiend, will sometimes stir up the public for a few days, but even that soon passes out of mind, and society settles back into its imperturbable apathy, retreating with each wave of excitement still further, and becoming by degrees proof against being stirred by anything that does not affect ourselves personally. Not so, however, in those days of Arcadian simplicity, for the astounding temerity of the piper's son, in laying felonious hands on the property of the village butcher, or baker, caused an excitement second only to a hanging or a first-class sensational horror, of later days. Poor Tom was a deal to be pitied as well as blamed, for although he was the one who committed the crime, he was not the only one who reaped a benefit therefrom. But the traditional historian tells us, he was the only one who was punished therefor, so, while we blame him, let us shed a tear of sympathy because he alone got the beating, the others the eating. The scene is graphically described thusly, Tom, Tom the piper's son, stole a pig, and away he ran. Here we see Tom, the good for nothing, standing idly around, listening to the witching strains of his father's bagpipe played by the industrious musician before the doors of the well-to-do villagers, with the laudable view of obtaining the wherewith to purchase the meat that both might eat, and while the instrument that has well served its day and generation is groaning and wheezing under the pressure brought to bear upon it, Tom's eyes, roving around from window to door, happen to light on a beautiful sucking pig, 
that reposes in all the innocent beauty of baby pighood before the open door of a zealous stickler for human rights. Alas! Tom is not acquainted with the gentlemanly owner of the fascinating pig, and he doesn't know how strong his principles are, nor how far he will go to maintain them. He gazes enraptured upon the dainty porker, and as he looks, the desire to own just such a one grows upon him, and soon it becomes a determination to own that identical one for never another could equal that. He looks stealthily around and finds the eyes of all are fixed upon the musician and his bagpipe. No one notices him, and hailing it as a happy omen, he pounces upon the coveted quadruped, grasps it tightly in his hands, and skedaddles. The music is ended and the crowd disperses. The absence of Piggy is unnoticed till the red-headed urchin whose playmate it is looks around for the loved companion, of his childish sports, and finds it not. Great research, amid loud outcries, is made, resulting only in the conviction that the pet of the family is gone, leaving no trace behind. Tom, with his prize exultingly hurries homeward, his heart swelling with joy at his luck. Like a dutiful son, he rushes to the arms of his maternal parent and deposits in her capacious lap the dainty prize. Visions of a luscious supper float through the mind of the female piperess, as she bestows her motherly benediction upon her thoughtful son and proceeds to put into execution the well-conned lesson of cooking a sucking pig. Having accomplished the first get-your-pig part, the rest comes easy, and at night, when the old piper returns, his olfactories are sainted with an odor that startles him from his generally despondent mood and awakens his curiosity as to the cause of such an unusual flavor from his usually flavorless abode. He enters and finds a smiling wife and son, with a smoking pig awaiting his coming. What next occurred the poet tells us in the laconic words the pig was eat. There was no necessity for describing the way of eating, the fact was enough. But alas! There is always a dark side to everything, and this happy family were no exception, the bones were left. They couldn't eat them, and they didn't own a dog, so they picked them clean and threw them away. But, murder will out and the tiny bones told their own tale. The village detective soon coupled the feet of the missing pig with the unusual occurrence of a heap of bones before the door of the musician's abode, and by a process of reasoning unknown to the detectives of the present day, decided that those bones were a pig's bones, a stolen pig's bones, from the fact that the piper did not earn enough to indulge in such luxuries as sucking pigs. Now who stole the sucking pig? Clearly not Madam Piper, for she was too fat and heavy to have any light-fingered proclivities. Clearly not the Piper himself, for he was playing his bagpipe and could prove an alibi. There was no one left but Tom. Circumstances pointed him out. He loved good eating and hated work, and had been noticed gazing upon the charms of the missing family pet. It was settled, then. Tom was the thief, and the offender must be punished. But how? Law was too uncertain and expensive, Tom was too poor to pay for the pig so it was resolved to take the worth of it out of him by beating. 
the poet tells us Tom was beat. Undoubtedly Tom was glad when they got through, and although he went roaring down the street it was a matter of rejoicing with him that he had saved his bacon. It was impossible to get that out through his hide, and they had no stomach pumps in those days. Scene. Dot, a city restaurant. Waiter, to customer, who is winding up his repast. Anything more, sir? Customer. H.M., well, yes, bring me an omelette souffle. Waiter. Omelet shoe fly, sir. Yes, sir. Exit, humming the popular tune. Unintentionally appropriate. The sun tells a very large story of its own circulation, and then innocently requests the false reporting tribune to copy it. By George. Continued. Lake George. September the 5th. Dear Punchinello, in my last I promised to finish my trip on the lake and give you some reliable rumors about the Rogers slide. I am prepared to do this today, in a happy and congratulatory frame of mind. I have had breakfast this morning. When I say this I mean that I have had this morning's breakfast this morning. Anyone who has achieved so remarkable a success, at this place, can safely plume himself on his patience and physical endurance. For instance, this morning, for the first time, I ordered broiled spring chicken. The waiter gave me a disconsolate look and proceeded to gird up his loins with a baseball belt. In a few moments he dashed past the window in hot pursuit of a fowl of venerable appearance, but of a style of going that would have put to shame any ostrich that Dr. Livingston ever saw. I asked the head waiter if he called that a spring chicken. He said he guessed that chicken could outspring any chicken in the place. This clears up another great hotel mystery. The man outflanked this gentle birdling on the eighth time round, in 6.23, which is considered very good indeed, and beats the time of the late Harvard and Yale fowl considerably. I say outflanked because it is not the intention of these sunny amendments to put an end to these feathery dexters immediately, but to drive them into the ten-pin alley, where they are leisurely bowled to an untimely end. As, however, pony balls are generally used, and there are always half a dozen darkies standing around ready to bet that the chicken won't be killed in 40 balls, or 60, as the case may be. This part of the process is rather tedious to the guest sometimes, when the chicken is not very active, there are not more than 9 or 10 pin feathers left. Well. The next place the boat stopped at is called Sabbath Day Point in consequence of Abercrombie having landed there on a Wednesday morning. Its name will therefore be considered a joke by such as see the point. A gentleman on board informed me that the water was so clear at this place that one could see objects when 30 feet from the bottom. I have thought and thought over this remark, but am unable to see what one's distance from the bottom has to do with his seeing objects. I give it up. On the opposite side of the lake is a hill called Sugarloaf Mountain, because it is a sweet place for loafers, I suppose. Finally we passed Roger's slide which is a rocky precipice 300 feet high, sloping nearly perpendicularly into the water. A decidedly unpleasant looking place for cellar door practice. 
there are a great many romantic traditions about this same Rogers, who is regarded by the simple natives as having been an altogether high-minded and gorgeous character, the fact being that he was one of those unmitigated old scamps who owe to the accident of having lived in revolutionary times. The distinction of being held up to the emulation of primary schools as a patriot hero. Literally he was simply an unmixed evil fighting only to steal something, and devoting what time and talent he could spare from his legitimate profession, which was seven up, to generally bedeviling and encroaching upon the neighboring Indians. As an entrochist he was immense. The noble Redskins alluded to finally concluded that enough was enough, and appointed a special commission to put a permanent end to the delicate attentions of the marked back. This sobriquet they conferred upon him partly on account of the fact that he usually received his wounds while leaving their immediate vicinity and partly because of a peculiar characteristic of the kind of cards he used. The commissioners caught Rogers out hunting, and chased him until he came to this precipice, down which he slid into the lake below, and, unfortunately, escaped unharmed. The Indians, who were pursuing him by the imprints of his snowshoes, soon arrived at the brink. Seeing what had occurred, they concluded to let him slide. Hence the name. Evidently they thought, from the trail, that he must have gone over. Though he was by no means a missionary, the tracks he had left produced a profound impression on their untutored minds. They at once concluded that he was drowned, or had got in with some bad spirits. It is obvious, however, to the most casual observer of the place, that the reverse must have been the case. The bad spirits were in him. The mark worn by Mr. R. S. Cheviots in his descent can still be distinctly seen. About halfway up is a shining object which is generally believed to be a suspender button. This, however, is merely conjectural. The clerk of the boat, of whom I have spoken before, tells me that until within a few years back, the hole in the water where Rogers struck could be seen. But it is all gone now he said shaking his head sadly. Nothing can escape the vandal horde of tourists and relic hunters. Piece by piece they have carried the hole away, and there is no trace of it left now. And he wept at my tranquility. At the north end of the lake we took stages for Fort Tikandraga. These vehicles were run by a man who was pointed out as a character which means a sort of licensed nuisance. The monomania of this individual was speech-making, and much reflection inclines me to the belief that he is some unappreciated politician who has invented a way of taking it out on the unhappy public as follows. He waits until his five immense stages arrive at some remote and solitary part of the road, then draws them up in a semicircle, mounts a stump, and, on pretense of exhibiting the beauties of nature, proceeds to harangue the helpless fares to the top of his very high bent, or until one of the slumbering outsides creates a welcome diversion by falling off and breaking his neck. We came to what was really a curiosity, two kinds of trees growing from one trunk, which this concentration of boars, this mitral use, in fact, improved accordingly. Here, ladies and gentlemen, 
you perceive one of the remarkable and peculiar works of a benign providence. On the right you see the sturdy and iron-hearted oak, while on the left you behold the modest and beautiful elm. What having has joined together let no man put asunder, jelling with your hoses. It must have been a Sunday school superintendent who invented excursions to Fort Ty. It is not a place to tie to. One old gentleman pointed to an underground hole and advised me to go and look at the magazine. I went, but it is hardly necessary to say that I didn't find any, and, on the whole, I was glad of it if people don't know any more than to leave their galaxies and harpers lying around loose when traveling, why, they deserve to have them stolen, that's all. I was sorry for the old gentleman, but if there is anything that disgusts me, it is to meet people that ain't posted about things. As the steamer neared the hotel, on our return, the departing sun was flinging back his last goodnight smile on the lovely scene below, and the musical chime of the little church at Caldwell came stealing sweetly over the bosom of the placid lake. As its fairy-like sounds reached our ears, a melancholy-looking man with long hair, who sat near, started, smiled, and turning to me, said, did I ever tell you that story about Sluka? As I had never seen the party before, I replied that if he had I had forgotten it. Sluka he repeated, gazing absently at the distant spire, Sluka comma he reiterated, rubbing his nose abstractedly with the handle of his umbrella, Sluka comma he continued, in my next my dear Punchinello, in my next. Seginor Dodd. To be continued. Dot. Source There can be no doubt that Gravy is in the right place, as a member of the Provisional Government of France. Old Gent. Don't scatter water on my feet, man, do you suppose I want him to grow any bigger? Education for Detectives Although our metropolitan detectives have hitherto failed to solve the mystery in which certain atrocious murders remain shrouded, yet it would be simply captious to impeach them, on that account, for lack of sagacity, zeal, courage, or any of the numerous other qualities that go to the making up of an efficient hawkshaw. That they are not deficient in zeal, at least, is manifest from a circumstance which took place a short time since. Counterfeiting had been carried on to a great extent in the city. The rashness of counterfeiters is proverbial, and they usually carry on their operations immediately under the nasal protuberance of the law. Nevertheless, in the case under notice, some vigilant detective, with a nose as sharp as that of a spitz dog, obtained a clue to the arrangements of the counterfeiters. Having informed some of his associates, a concerted descent was made by the party upon a house in one of the lower streets of the city. A portion of the house is, and has been for years past, occupied by several artists connected with the illustrated press. Few gentlemen are better known in large circles than these artists, none more highly appreciated by hosts of friends. But duty is duty, often stern, but never to be shirked and so the faithful detectives inserted their spitz dog noses between the joints of the artists' doors, and, having smelt a very large rat, suddenly burst in upon these graphic malefactors, and caught them in the act, 
with all the tools and paraphernalia of their nefarious occupations scattered about their vile den. Most of them were engaged in executing drawings upon blocks of wood, although it is probable that some of them were smoking pipes, tobacco being vastly conducive to that concentration of thought by which alone great mental efforts can be followed by equivalent results. Short work was made by the sagacious detectives when they saw the graphic malefactors engaged in their diabolical toil. Some of the officers seized the implements of the gang, while others collared the delinquents, and marched them through the streets to the nearest police station, where they were thrust into a dungeon and locked up for the night. Next morning, on being taken before a magistrate, the prisoners were discharged, on the grounds that the affair was a mistake, or a joke, we are not exactly informed which, but the parties chiefly interested do not look upon it as a joke. Now it is a very clear case that the mistake in question, or joke, may be traced to a deficiency of education on the part of these vigilant and zealous detectives. Had they been properly cultivated in the various branches of art, the slight blunder to which we refer could not have occurred. The Spitz dog noses, instead of smelling rat, would have smelt its anagram, art. Its influence would at once have been acknowledged by them, and they would have backed out from the august presence with obsequious genuflections. It becomes a question of moment, then, whether a course of lectures upon art should not henceforth be considered an indispensable branch of the education of our excellent detectives. We would not limit the proposed extension of their education, however, to the study of art, alone. Botany should be insisted on as a necessary accession to the stock of the detective's learning, and especially would we have them instructed in a full knowledge of the leguminous vegetables, such as beans. Temporary Obscuration of the Hub Boston already has the biggest church organ in all creation. She also has the most public public garden of modern times. Last year she had the loudest musical jubilee ever organized, and it is further to be noted that she is the proud possessor of the most uncommon of commons. Early in October, however, all these cherished immensities of Boston must fall into insignificance and feel small. On the second day of that month, Colonel Fisk is to make his triumphant entry into Boston, at the head of the gallant ninth. Organ, Jubilee, Public Garden, Big Drum, Common, all, all of these will then have to subside and fade away into thin air before the stately presence of the Prince of Erie and his valiant command. Boy and Man Miss Annie P. Ladd, of Augusta, me, has been appointed by the Governor and confirmed by the Council as a Justice of the Peace. To be a man and magistrate twas natural that Annie sighed, since she one phase of man's estate already as a lad had tried. A nut for the ladies' club. Referring to the recent ladies' boat race at Harlem, a reporter says that the girls all rode badly. This is a discouraging comment on the frantic efforts now making by women to assume man's attributes, not to mention his other buttes and the what do ye call ems generally associated with them and it is a very significant fact that the comment can be tersely clinched by the words so rose sis. New Publications 
Among the numerous portraits of the late Charles Dickens now before the public, none are likely to be more popular than one in chromograph lately issued by Prang and Company, of Boston and New York. It represents the great and genial writer as some few years younger than he was when he last visited this country. The expression of the face is one of thought, rather as he might have appeared when meditating over some new turn to be given to the thread of a narrative, than as he used to look when reading to an audience. This picture is printed in two or three simple tints, of which the flesh tint is the most predominant. It is set in an oval pass partu, and requires only a glass over it to fit it for placing on a wall. A T. Stewart and Company have just received several cases Paris made silk and poplin street and evening dresses two cases cloth and velvet pattern sacks, cloaks, and c, an opening of handsome trimmed hats, latest Paris style. Also, children's and Mrs. undergarments, infants' outfits, etc., etc. Several cases real India camel's hair shawls, at unusually attractive prices. Embroideries, laces, real lace and llama points, dresses, and sea wedding trousseau. The above forms only a very small portion of their large and attractive stock of elegant goods, imported and domestic made. Offered at Broadway, 4th Avenue, 9th and 10th Streets. Punchinello. The first number of this illustrated humorous and satirical weekly paper was issued under date of the 2nd of April, 1870. The press and the public in every state and territory of the Union endorse it as the best paper of the kind ever published in America. Contents entirely original. Subscription for one year with $2 premium, $4 6 months, without premium. 2.003 months. 1.00 single copies mailed free, for 10 we offer the following elegant premiums of L. Prang and Company's chromos for subscriptions as follows, a copy of paper for one year and the awakening, a litter of puppies. Half chromo. Size 8-3 forward slash 8 by 11-1 forward slash 8, $2 picture, for, $4 a copy of paper for one year and either of the following $3 chromos, wild roses. 12-1 forward slash 8x9. Dead Game 11 1 forward slash 8 x 8 3 forward slash 8 Easter Morning 6 3 forward slash 4 x 10 1 forward slash 4 4 5 dollars a copy of paper for one year and either of the following 5 dollars chromos Group of Chickens Group of Ducklings Group of quails. Each 10x12-1 forward slash 8. The poultry yard. 10-1 forward slash 8x14. The barefoot boy, wild fruit. Each 9-3 forward slash 4x13. Pointer and quail, spaniel and woodcock. 10x12. For $6.50 a copy of paper for one year and either of the following $6 chromos, the baby in trouble, the unconscious sleeper, the two friends, dog and child. Each 13x16-1 forward slash 4. 
spring, summer, autumn, 12-7 forward slash 8x16-1 forward slash 8. The kids' playground. 11x17-1 forward slash 2, 4. $7 a copy of paper for one year and either of the following $7.50 chromos, strawberries and baskets, cherries and baskets, currants, each 13x18, horses in a storm, 22-1 forward slash 4x15-1 forward slash 4, 6 Central Park Views A Set 9-1 Forward Slash 8x4-1 Forward Slash 2 4 $8 A Copy of Paper for One Year and 6 American Landscapes A Set 4-3 Forward Slash 8x9 Price $9.00 4 $9 a copy of paper for one year and either of the following $10 chromos, Sunset in California. Beerstadt, 18-1 forward slash 2x12 Easter morning. 14x21. Correggio's Magdalen. 12-1 forward slash 4x16-3 forward slash 8. Summer fruit, and autumn fruit. Half chromos, 15-1 forward slash 2x10-1 forward slash 2. Companions, price $10 for the two, for $10 remittances should be made in PO orders, drafts or bank checks on New York, or registered letters. The paper will be sent from the first number, April 2d, 1870, when not otherwise ordered. Postage of paper is payable at the office where received, 20 cents per year, or 5 cents per quarter, in advance, the chromos will be mailed free on receipt of money. Canvases wanted, to whom liberal commissions will be given. For special terms address the company. The first ten numbers will be sent to anyone desirous of seeing the paper before subscribing, for 60 cents. A specimen copy sent to anyone desirous of canvassing or getting up a club, on receipt of postage stamp. Address, Punchinello Publishing Co., P.O. Box, 2783. Number 83 Nassau Street, New York. A T. Stewart and Company offer the largest, richest, and cheapest stock of dress goods, that has ever been offered in this city, comprising many novelties in poplins, armors cloths, epping lines extra quality merinos, ladies cloths, and c, and c. A large line of domestic shirtings, sheetings, blankets, flannels, and every variety of housekeeping goods. Broadway, 4th Avenue, 9th and 10th Streets. Extraordinary bargains in carpets. 5 frame English Brussels, reduced to $1.75 per yard. 200 pieces 5 frame English Brussels, greater part confined styles, reduced to $2 per yard. Very best quality English tapestry Brussels $1.30 per yard. French Moquettes and Axe Minsters. $3.50 and $4 per yard. Royal Wiltons, best quality, $2.50 and $3 per yard. Crossley's Velvets, choice designs, 
$2.50 per yard. Superfin in grains, 3 plies. English and domestic oil cloths, rugs, mats, etc., at extremely low prices. A T. Stewart & Co. Broadway, 4th Ave, 9th and 10th Streets. Feeding Sparrows. A hint to a certain class of humanitarians the printing house of the United States. Geo.f.nesbit and Co. General Job Printers. Blank Book Manufacturers. Stationers. Wholesale and Retail. Lithographic Engravers and Printers. Copper Plate Engravers and Printers. Card manufacturers, envelope manufacturers, fine cut and color printers. 163, 165, 167, and 169 per ST, 73, 75, 77, and 79 Pine ST, New York. Advantages All on the same premises, and under immediate supervision of the proprietors. Tourists and leisure travelers will be glad to learn that the Erie Railway Company has prepared combination excursion or round-trip tickets, valid during the entire season, and embracing Ithaca, headwaters of Cayuga Lake, Niagara Falls. Lake Ontario, the River St. Lawrence, Montreal, Quebec, Lake Champlain, Lake George, Saratoga, the White Mountains and all principal points of interest in northern New York, the Canadas, and New England. Also similar tickets at reduced rates, through Lake Superior enabling travelers to visit the celebrated iron mountains and copper mines of that region. By applying at the offices of the Erie Railway Company, numbers 241, 529 and 957 Broadway, 205 Chambers Street, 38 Greenwich Street, Co. 125th St. and 3rd Avenue Harlem, 338 Fulton Street, Brooklyn, Depot's Foot of Chambers Street, and Foot of 23rd Street, New York, No. 3 Exchange Place and Long Dock Depot, Jersey City, and the agents at the principal hotels, travelers can obtain just the ticket they desire as well as all the necessary information. Prang's latest publications, Wild Flowers Water Lilies Chaz. Dickens. Prang's chromos sold in all art and bookstores throughout the world. Prang's illustrated catalogue sent free on receipt of stamp. L. Prang & Co., Boston. Punchinello. With a large and varied experience in the management and publication of a paper of the class herewith submitted, and with the still more positive advantage of an ample capital to justify the undertaking, the Punchinello Publishing Co. of the City of New York, presents to the public for approval the new illustrated humorous and satirical weekly paper, Punchinello, the first number of which was issued under date of April 2. Original articles, suitable for the paper, and original designs, or suggestive ideas or sketches for illustrations, upon the topics of the day, are always acceptable and will be paid for liberally. Rejected communications cannot be returned, unless postage stamps are enclosed. Terms, 1 copy, p. 
per year, in advance, $4 single copies. 10 a.m. specimen copy will be mailed free upon the receipt of 10 cents. One copy, with the Riverside Magazine, or any other magazine or paper, price, $2.50, for 5.501 copy, with any magazine or paper, price, $4.00. For 7.00 all communications, remittances, etc., to be addressed to Punchinello Publishing Co., No. 83 Nassau Street P.O. Box, 2783, New York. The Mystery of Mr. E. Drood. The New Burlesque Serial. Written expressly for Punchinello, by Orpheus C. Kerr, commenced in number 11. Will be continued weekly throughout the year. A sketch of the eminent author, written by his bosom friend, with superb illustrations of 1st the author's palatial residence at Bagads Hill, Tickner's Fields, New Jersey. 2 nd the author at the door of said palatial residence taken as he appears every Saturday will also be found in the same number. Single copies, for sale by all newsmen, or mailed from this office, free, 10 cents. Subscription for one year, one copy, with $2 chromo premium. $4. Those desirous of receiving the paper containing this new serial, which promises to be the best ever written by Orpheus C. Kerr, should subscribe now, to ensure its regular receipt weekly. We will send the first ten numbers of Punchinello to anyone who wishes to see them, in view of subscribing, on the receipt of 60 cents. Address Punchinello Publishing Company, P.O. Box, 2783-83 Nassau Street, New York. G.O. W. Wheat & Co., Printer, No. 8 Spruce Street. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook Punchinello, Volume 2, No. 27. The 1st of October, 1870 asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one. The old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the Foundation, and you can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by US copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start, 
Full license the full project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works. By using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1 General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1. By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property trademark forward slash copyright agreement if you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of project gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession if you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the Foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, 
check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1. Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1. E. 1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1. E. 2. If an individual project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 Do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license terms from this work or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, 
If you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 you may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.e.9 If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact the foundation as set forth in section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, 
Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited warranty, disclaimer of damages, except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any. You paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent or employee of the foundation, Anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees 
that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. A. Distribution of this or any project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. B. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. And C. Any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg trademark symbol's goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help. See Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, C. 3. Educational Corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The Foundation's INE or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, UT 84116. 801-596-1887 Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact section 4 Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. 
to send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. Punchinello Volume 2 Number 27 Published by the Punchinello Publishing Company, 83 Nassau Street New York. The full Project Gutenberg license.